Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, welcome to the first session, post the keynote. Uh, so today's session is called Faulty by Design, a psychological examination of how our decisions are guided and made. Um, we're here with uh, Bill Gribbins and Bob Thomas. Um, if you, this is not the session you are looking for, the exit doors are to <laughs> your left and to your right. Uh, <laughs> uh, please feel free to take photos. Um, you do not have to take videos or video selfies because we are recording everything. Uh, so if you also do not want to be recorded mm -hmm. or have your uh, image in any uh, online media for the session, you can also leave. <laughs> uh, and then finally, uh, uh, don't forget to share uh, the hashtag is UXPA2016. Um, and we will have slides um, and media from this presentation shared um, afterward if you would like. Um, so you're in for a real treat. Uh, I'll let Bob and uh, Bill take it away. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Great. So go ahead, Bill. Very good. Uh, so I'm Bill Grivens. I'm the direct. I'm the director of the graduate program um, in UX at uh, Bentley University, and have worked for more than 30 years in the usability in the UX field. And I'm Bob Thomas. I'm the director of user experience research at Liberty Mutual Insurance. And today, Bill and I are going to talk about faulty by design, a psychological examination of how our decisions are guided and made. So my interest in this topic has grown over the last 30 years working in this area with clients who constantly complain about the bad decisions that have been made by their users or by their customers. And often those bad decisions are classified as user errors. But when you study human decision making, you realize that bad decision making is fairly predictable when you, when you look at humans and some of the limitations um, that we face. So what we're going to examine this morning is decision making as a window into all human behavior. That's why I love studying in this particular area, because the individual variables and elements um, that we're looking at here today will affect a lot of human computer interactions. So it's much bigger than just decision making itself. Uh, the most important thing to take away from this is that you can predict that human decision making is going to be rather faulty. So we should design the support for that. Uh, what are the underlying causes for this? Uh, what is the effects of this on the user behavior and performance? And then Bob's going to spend a lot of time talking about how do we design to support and to enhance and to improve human decision making. So are we good at making decisions, especially when it comes to, I'm going to stand over here, especially when it comes to uh, making purchases, including big ticket items like a car or a house. So classical economic theory holds that we're all rational creatures. We're all driven by self-interest and know exactly what we want. So we weigh the pros and cons of everything before we make a decision, including a purchase decision. So we say, say to ourselves, I know why I bought that house. I know every coverage I chose when I uh, signed up for my car insurance policy. I have a 401k strategy. But these, uh, but these assumptions all break down because we don't make decisions consciously. We, we're emotional and irrational. Think gut reactions. So Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist. He won a Nobel Prize in economics and wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. And he classifies the way we process information into two systems. Feeling or intuition, he calls system one. And this is very fast and automatic. And it's evolved out of our survival instincts. So we say to ourselves, oh, look over there, a grizzly bear, danger. Oh, look over there, a turkey, delicious. And that's system one. And again, it's evolved out of our survival instincts. Thinking a rational thought, he calls system two and it's very slow and ponderous. So if you think about multiplying numbers like 17 by 24, or calculating the tip on a restaurant bill, that is an example of system two thinking. But Kahneman claims that most of our thinking, in fact, 95% of our thinking, is driven by system one. So again, think survival instincts. It's quick and it's intuitive. Now why is this important? It's important because companies today realize that 
their customers don't know the how and why behind their purchase decisions. So we, we are making faulty decisions, as Bill pointed out. So we're optimized for system one. We've evolved that way to survive. We're not optimized for system two, where we labor over every decision. So what happens here is we think we're, making, we're using system two and making good decisions, but we actually aren't. And that's causing a lot of problems for us. Um, so what does that mean? Well, as UX professionals, what we need to do is design for system two, to optimize for system two. And as, in this way, we have to design for the way real people think and real people um, behave. Oops, I better go back over here. That is, we as um, UX designers, UX researchers, developers, product managers, we have to augment people's thinking. What we have to do is build in design scaffolding, in other words, design supports to allow people to make better decisions for themselves. Very good. So as I said, I think the most important thing to take away is that we're really very bad at decision making. And, and we should also acknowledge that there are what we call optimizers in the world. Um, so somebody, somebody might be sitting in the audience here and saying, I'm a really good decision maker and I make good decisions and I think them through very logically and systematically. Um, and, and that's true. There are optimizers in this world. And what we're really looking at is the, the bulk of the human population, the average user. Uh, we're designed to minimize effort. We're really resource constrained in terms of the amount of thinking resource that we have available. So we're really optimized to give that out very sparingly and to come up with a good enough response. And that's that system one that Bob talked about. And, and for most of life, good enough is good enough. Um, and again, there's a, there's a pretty large margin for error in a lot of life. But in certain areas of our lives, we have to make critical decisions. And they're held to a much higher standard. So behavioral economists often look at the two most important areas of our lives, uh, one being our financial, uh, wealth and, and well-being um, and our health and wellness. Okay, these are things that are very, very important in our lives. And they say if there's any place in our lives where we're going to be making logical, rational decisions, it should be in these two areas because they're most critical to us. But again, when you look at reality and how people actually behave, so again, when you look at you know the financial side of it, when you pull adult Americans, their number one financial concern is having enough money for retirement. And I think you'd all agree to that. Uh, but then you look at the actual statistics and look at people's saving behavior and the decisions they make around planning for that retirement. Just over half of adult Americans are saving anything for a retirement. And then you look at one subset of that population, people who are in the 45 to 50 year old range. Okay, these are the people who are staring retirement in the face. You would think they'd be most highly motivated. 50% of that population have saved less than 25%, excuse me, $25,000 for retirement. I don't know about you, but I'm going to spend that in six months of retirement. Mm -hmm. So again, that's a very scary statistic to see. My number one concern is having enough money and our behavior is very, very different. And our health care is not any different. You know, we all talk about that we want to age in a very healthy way in our body and in our mind, yet our behaviors don't reflect that. Um, you know, in terms of what we eat, uh, the risky behaviors that we engage in. Again, 80% of adults don't exercise enough. Four out of five people who sign, uh, uh, sign up for gym memberships don't use them. 80 to 95% of dieters uh, regain everything they've lost uh, within three years. So again, we say one thing and we behave in the here and now in a very different way in the decisions that we make. So what is decision making? Let's, let's begin with a very simple definition of it is it's uncertainty. Uh, we're in a given place, you know, where I am now and where I want to be. Some goals, sometimes they're well-defined, sometimes they're rather fuzzy. But in between where I am now and where I want to go, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of choices. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of missing information. There's a lot of fuzzy information. 
And there's a lot of other variables that we as UX professionals should be thinking about along the way. Uh, we should be thinking about things like time to act. So when a user has to perform an action very quickly, that puts pressure on them. It actually produces stress and anxiety that we're going to talk about more, which will actually lower the quality of the decision making. We need to look at people's fatigue level. So again, like, and these will combine in interesting ways. So look at a doctor that might be engaged with a diagnostic system. He has a patient before him um, that is coding in a very serious, life-threatening situation. Time to act is critical. Stress levels are very high. Oh, and let's think about a doctor who's been on a 16-hour shift, very, very fatigued. Are they making the same quality of decision at the end of that 16-hour shift as they did at the beginning of the day? What is the risk involved? I make the wrong decision, the patient dies. So many decisions that we make in our lives, you know, we can recover from. And then there are other decisions in our lives that have rather serious consequences. So what is that level of risk? And that risk level will then interact with stress and anxiety. Cognitive disabilities. Okay, there's a large percentage of pop the population here, adults and children, uh, here and globally, who have various levels of cognitive disability. This might actually equate to down in the bottom here around aging. Uh, we have a more diminished cognitive capacity as we age. So we look at that cognitive disability and look at how that might affect decision making. So when we force our elders into making rather serious decisions about their health care, end of life decisions, treatments, health care treatments, are they capable of handling the, de the demands of that decision making? And should we blame them when they make bad decisions? Confidence levels. So the interesting thing is, you know, Kahneman and others talk about, and it's well documented, that again, humans are bad at decision making. But you ask the average person about their performance in decision making in their lives, what are they going to tell you? I'm really good. Everybody's <laughs> overly confident. And then there's some cultural variables involved here as well. So culture is here as well. Um, some cultures are more overly confident than others. They display overconfidence. Other cultures display a lower level of confidence. Um, and actually cultures will vary on their risk tolerance as well. So there's some interesting interactions that we need to consider here around decision support as uh, UX designers. And then finally, what is the available information? And, and again, Bob will talk light later about framing, how we frame things that will drive decisions one way or the other. And is the information simply available that they need? It's not enough that the information is in their head. It needs to be in the world, and it needs to be captured in the design. So what's wrong with this? Is, is, is it a hardware or a software problem? Is it a problem with our brain? Is it a problem with our mind? Uh, the good news is the brain is OK. Uh, it's really a software problem. And it's really around resource, the resource that is available. And we often capture that under the heading of what we call load. So what do we have to give? And does the decision-making environment exceed that capacity to give? And again, that capacity to give is determined by all of those variables that I discussed on the earlier slide. It's also affected by anxiety, which we introduced. Um, as the anxiety level increases, uh, anxiety consumes some of that attentional resource, that attentional resource that's needed for good decision making. And I think we know that there's places and times in our lives where we're overwhelmed by stress and we're literally paralyzed by it. So decision making in that kind of environment is going to be very, very poor. And then again, we also have this near-term focus, and Bob touched on this in that system one, is we're really designed and optimized to survive. This is how we've evolved as humans, is to be here tomorrow to fight another day. So we have very much a near-term focus. And I think this is the problem we see in financial planning and healthcare planning and things like that, is your 18, your 20, your 25, your 30. Retirement is 50 years away. We're designed to have fun and enjoy life today. And it's really hard and somewhat unnatural to be planning for the future. So as we look at the issue of load, um, psychologists will often talk about the fact that humans are cognitive misers. And that means we rarely give enough thinking resource to meet the demands of the task. 
So that should be our assumption going into this. I think sometimes, again, it's mischaracterized as, oh, I've got a careless user, or I have a lazy user, or I have an inattentive user. It's just a natural human being. And I think we have to accept that and design for that. So again, what we do then is we engage in a variety of things, heuristics and biases. And these are just thinking shortcuts. And these are operating in that system one. They're very fast, very rapid, don't use a lot of resource, and more often than not, they're good enough. Now, in critical decision-making um, scenarios, they, it can be very much problematic that people are engaged with these. So notions of satisficing. Satisficing comes out of Herbert Simon's work from the 1950s, where he talked about the fact that people are not optimizing the value of the outcome of their decision-making. They're often accepting something less to lower their investment costs. And so humans will tell you they want to do one thing, but they will more often not be satisfied with something that is less than that if it minimizes their investment cost. We also engage in the optimism bias. And this is, again, we're overly optimistic. And, and again, I think we have to be optimistic in life or we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. So we always have this optimistic view, and it, and it does help us to encourage us to perform at higher levels. But sometimes we're falsely, overly confident. When we're buying an insurance policy because, you know what, I don't want to spend a lot of money on health insurance for my family. So, and that's not me personally, but let's just sit, go with that <laughs> scenario and say I'm, I, I'm not going to buy the health insurance policy that I really should. But you know what, this is going to be a good year. Nobody's going to get sick. Nobody's going to go to the emergency room. There's not going to be any ear infections or broken bones or anything like that. So in order to deal with the anxiety of not being covered properly, we're overly optimistic. We're falsely optimistic. The availability bias is what is the information that comes to mind most easily. So it could be that you made a decision in a somewhat f familiar or similar um, case just a couple of weeks ago. That information is going to be most available to you in your mind. However, it might not apply to this situation. But it's going to drive your decision making in, in powerful ways. The anchoring bias. This is used by um, merchandisers all the time. So you'll go to a mattress store and they'll say, oh, this mattress is $1,700. But today it's $800. And even $800 might be a lot for a mattress. But compared to $1,700, it's a deal. So what you do is you anchor on the $1,700, you're comparing the $800 price against that anchor, and it looks like a good deal, and it drives your decision making. We simplify choices. So Kahneman talks about this fact when humans are faced with really complex, difficult questions, more often than not what we do is we answer a simpler one. So what we do is we reduce the complexity of really, really demanding uh, decisions or thinking activities. Um, so what we do is, and again, it would be nice if we did it in a logical, rational way, but more often than done not, it's done very quickly using these biases. Um, lastly is heuristics. Heuristics in the hands of an expert are often good. They recognize patterns in a new decision make, a new decision that needs to be made that seems to match patterns they've seen in the past and they have su successful kind of strategies to attack that, and they apply them quite freely. And it works very, very nicely. I think for the average person, and I often use the example of simple rules, so like in my household, we have a rule. For years, we struggled with, should we buy those extended warranties when we go to the store? You know, when you get up there at Home Depot and you have the hammer, and they say, for $2 more, you can have an extended warranty. And we bought those for years. Well, truth be told, that's the worst possible deal you could possibly make. And they make a fortune off of that. And what they do is they force you into making that decision every time you're at the cash register. And you know it's a bad deal, and you get sucked into it every time. So we have a simple rule in our house. Just say no. Okay? No matter what. And we'll find ourselves still at the cash register, you know, kind of hemming and hawing. Should we do it this time? It doesn't seem like a lot. No, just say no. And there's times you'll lose on it, but probability is that you will win more often than you lose. And that's what you have to have is simple rules. So Bill mentioned cognitive load and cognitive capacity. And so a lot of times what we'll do is instead of weighing the pros and cons of everything, we'll take mental shortcuts. And we do this a lot when it comes to assessing risks. 
So we'll assess risk by how easy examples come to mind. So we're going to be biased often by how recent or how memorable um, those experiences are. As, as Bill mentioned, this is the availability bias that we're dealing with. So say, for example, there's a plane crash in the news, and it's in a, a recent event. That might be top of mind. And we might be very leery of flying and may not want to fly. We might hedge our bets. We might take out an extra life insurance policy just in case. Or we might, in fact, decide that we want to drive uh, instead of fly, even though there's a better probability of our getting in a car accident than it is of us getting in, into a plane crash. So these are all, all problems that we, that we deal with um, because we're really um, bad when it comes to these cognitive issues that Bill mentioned. We, we, we're really bad at, at, at measuring probability, determining probability, because we're only looking at very um, small and recent examples. So this might explain why um, in the insurance industry, for example, the demand for earthquake insurance or flood insurance goes up after an earthquake or a flood. So that doesn't really help us after the fact. <laughs> but what happens after the fact often is some insurance companies will up those premiums because there's a big demand for it. So we have to watch out as consumers and also as UX professionals working for these types of companies about these dark patterns where we take advantage of people's availability bias or the recency effect and prey on those, those fears that we might have. So one example is after 9-11, some insurance companies offered terrorism insurance at a real premium at a higher price than the same amount, than the same amount of insurance for death due to any reason including terrorism. Um, and there are other examples of, the, of these dark pa patterns and evil by design out there. For example, Ryanair is a low-cost uh, airline based out of Ireland. And what they would do for people who would buy tickets online is they would automatically opt you in for travel insurance and make it very difficult for you to opt out of that. Now, they've stopped this practice, but I know uh, from my experience, probably our own experiences, how sometimes we sign up for uh, things and we're automatically opt in for them and it's hard to not to get out of them. It's hard to stop that auto renewal. We can't do it on the site. We have to call, call somebody up. So what do we have to do in these cases? Well, as consumers, we probably want to do business with those companies that can help us make better decisions. And as UX professionals, especially in this area of social media when, where transparency is so important and all this information is available to us, we want to design um, solutions that allow our customers to make better decisions. And I speak to you from somebody who works in the insurance industry where we're sort of held in the same, reg same high regard as used car dealers. So, um, so what we have to do, and I know what I have to do, is be able to design more consultative and engaging experiences for our consumers, or they're just going to go to another company. So again, Bill mentioned load, cognitive capacity. So what do we do when we were presented with a lot of possibilities? Um, so I've eaten at the Cheesecake Factory a number of times. And it's a very popular restaurant. It's, I think they're franchised uh, across the country. But I sit down, and I'm overwhelmed by possibility. I'm given a 20-page menu, and I don't know what to choose. And the more choices I have, the higher expectations I have, right? I want to choose the right thing. Oh, should I choose the steak? Oh, why did I get the steak? I should have got the salmon. Oh, why did I get the raspberry che cheesecake? I should have gotten the chocolate nut macadamia caramel cheesecake, and all of that. And then what that leads to is buyer's remorse. And you know, frankly, I just don't eat at the Cheesecake Factory anymore. <laughs> um, so what, what do some companies out there do for us in terms of uh, the restaurant industry? Well, uh, for example, some fast food places are offering four for four meals. You know, so instead of walking into a Wendy's or a Burger King and looking up at that big board and trying to decide your options from everything that's up there, I'll just go for the four for four meal, four, op four options for four dollars. And some restaurants are taking it to even a bigger extreme. So um, one um, restaurant in the UK offers one item on their menu, steak and chips. So you're not going to have buyer's remorse here. You might have restaurant remorse, <laughs> but you're not going to have buyer's remorse here. 
Another example of being overwhelmed by possibilities. Consider Medicare. I have to consider Medicare in the near future. So I went online two weeks ago and took a look at my options. The first three steps were pretty easy. Easy to fill out information. It was pretty much name, rank, serial number, and I was done. Then I got to step four, refine your solutions. And I was presented with 50 plans available and eight uh, independent <coughs> filters. And I just essentially shut it down because I was overwhelmed. Now, in this case, Medicare could have helped me with filters. Filters are a good way to control that disclosure by refining our results. But offering filters before we see the results is very crazy because I don't know what these filters do and how they interact with each other. So a better solution is offered by um, a company like Kayak, and I really like them. Um, you can go on, on there and enter very um, uh, minimal information, like the city I'm, I'm traveling from, the city I'm traveling to, and the dates I'm traveling, and then I can refine the results. I can take a look at the number of stops. I can take a look at the times I want to leave, I wanna, and I can even choose airlines. So instead of taking a look at thousands of options and being overwhelmed by them, I can refine those results to get me where I want to be. So last example on this slide is um, related to car insurance. So buying car insurance is very complex. Coverages are very complex. And in the face of this complexity, we may refuse to add coverages that may protect us, that may benefit us. So what Progressive does is it ends up bundling or packaging up these coverages um, um, at the end of the process. So it gives us three choices to choose from. And then it even recommends a choice for us to make. And it's called choice. And so at the end of this process, we sort of feel like we're in more control and that we've chose the coverage that's right for me. But is this type of nudging, I call this nudging, good? Is it objective? Essentially what Progressive is doing is it's putting these, these packages in this particular order for us, and it's even making a recommendation for us. So it's subtly bringing us to this, this one solution. Um, so they're, fr they're influencing us, framing the results for us, and maybe influencing us without us being aware of it sometimes. And sometimes companies do this uh, for the benefit of us as consumers, and sometimes they do it for their benefit. And I don't mean to pick just on progressive because all of us in the insurance industry do use this model of relative choice where we offer people three or four choices to choose from. So I'm going to leave you with this idea before I get uh, to the next slide. You know, is nudging good? Well, as we say in UX, it depends. But I would try and offer to you maybe a better way to do this would be to offer choices to people without recommending those choices for them. So in other words, let the, the user, let the consumer make that final choice and don't push it onto them. Okay, so I mentioned as one of the variables that really determine um, the quality of the decision making that people make. We've, we've discussed load already. The next one is anxiety. And, and again, this is an interesting tension that goes on in the mind to manage anxiety. Um, and again, a lot of it is to suppress the anxiety because I think we've all experienced again in our lives kind of the crippling effects of anxiety where you know, we don't feel good, we don't eat, we don't sleep, our performance at work is not good, so on and so forth. So it can have a very crippling, debilitating effect on us as humans. So the mind is really designed to keep anxiety in check and not always in the most you know, healthy sort of way so it doesn't seem logical and rational. The logical and rational thing is just kind of to face your fears head on and deal with them and be done with it. But a lot of this we tend to suppress. So again, some of the behaviors that we have to think about here in terms of how we manage this anxiety then how it affects people as they interact with our products is tunnel vision or co cognitive narrowing. So again, decision making is a series of choices. And once we start going down a choice path, the longer we travel down that path, the less likely it is that we're going to get off that path. The tunnel gets closer and closer in, and it gets narrower and narrower. 
and we're less likely to leave that and to consider other options. So again, and how do we as, as designers get people to consider those other options before they travel down that tunnel? As they start to travel down that tunnel, they engage in other behaviors as well because as you're traveling down that tunnel, you're beginning to commit. And, and committing to a decision is a good thing. I mean, ultimately, we have to commit. So committing is a good thing. But when we start to see conflicting and challenging information, it produces anxiety, going like, oh, maybe I'm not going down the right path. So we have this tendency to selectively omit. Once we start to get to that stage of, of, of committing to a decision or a course of action, we have a tendency to omit, sometimes consciously, more often than not subconsciously, information that is conflicting that's going to produce anxiety. And again, that's not healthy, it's not logical, it's not rational, but it's the way we behave. We also, at the same time, engage in confirmational bias. And confirmational bias is just the opposite of omission. What we start to do is we start to favor and we're biased towards information that supports the path that we're traveling down. And this could just be information that we're finding, you know, again, on a web page. It could be people surrounding us, so on and so forth, that it's endorsing what we're doing and the course of action we've decided to take. But we tend to favor that information because that's not producing any anxiety. In fact, it's making us confident. So we favor that kind of information. So we have to think about, okay, how do we control for this in product design? And then finally, avoidance behavior. I'm good at this one, okay? So the, we, we know there are decisions that we need to make in life. Like, you know, again, open enrollment period within your companies when you have to make your health plan decision. When do most of you make your health plan decision? Yeah, well, yeah, usually the last day during open enrollment period. For me, it's usually the last hour. And what am I most likely to do? Choose the same plan I did, chose last year. So it's just that inertia, we just keep going. And we do that, that's what we do. We avoid it, it's the most important decision. And in my, my life, I have six people that depend on me and my family, and I do it in the last hour. I, I should really be thinking about it a, a lot more. I don't think I'm gonna get the Father of the Year award after this talk, but, uh, <laughs> but, but all of us do that, and it's so important to be honest about this. Again, because most of us, again, are overly confident, and we're not honest about the bad decisions that we make in our lives. So as Bill mentioned earlier, anxiety consumes a lot of our resources. So to deal with that, our mind suppresses that anxiety because we don't want to consider all these possibilities. Otherwise, we'd be paralyzed with we'd be paralyzed with inaction and just shut down. And so, a lot of times, what we do is, as Bill pointed out, we sort of succumb to tunnel vision and narrow our options and just look at a few things. We put the blinders on, and we don't want to look at conflicting ideas and opinions. So, for example, let's take buying a house. Um, maybe it's a house that you can't afford, but you want to buy this house. So you'll instead succumb to what Bill mentioned as the confirmation bias. You'll just listen to uh, ideas and look at evidence and opinions that mirror what you think. And then you'll Hello? Yeah, you got my back on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, or you might also succumb to the uh, a bias of omission or avoidance and um, avoid all of those other opinions. You just want to narrow your vision and look at what you want to do. So again, let's say you want to buy this house. Can you afford this house? You don't know, but you want to buy this house. Why? Is it a good investment? You don't know. You don't care. It's on the beach. That's what you care about. <laughs> so what you'll do is you'll tell yourself, you know, maybe home prices are going to appreciate. So this will work out pretty well for me. And I know it's a pretty you know, new house, so it's not going to need any repairs. Or you might say things like, it's on the beach, but what are the chances it's going to get hit by a storm or succumb to a flood? That's probably not going to happen. And then you'll tell yourself, uh, well, you know, I'll make sacrifices. I won't go on vacation. I won't eat out. And on and on and on and on and on. So what do we do in, in this case? Well, there are, there are companies out there that can help us with their design principles, with, these, with this scaffolding and these design reports, supports. So for example, 
Zillow helps us, providing us with these simple filters that can help us look at information. And so what this does is it doesn't allow these irrational and emotional forces to play out uh, irrationally in our subconscious. So they give us information in small bits, disclosing this information. So they might start with an overview here, where they give our, us pictures. They um, show us what the price of the property is. They tell us what the number of bed, beds and baths are. And then we can scroll down and look at other information there. So we can take a look at how much Zillow estimates the price to be. And I, um, if you look down to the bottom, of that screenshot, you'll notice that they have little accordion drawers there. And that really helps us when we're processing information. So instead of seeing all this information at once, we can choose to open and close these, these small bits of information, these, these accordion drawers, and look at, at the information that can help us make better decisions. So we can look at the price and tax history. We can look at comparable homes. We can, in fact, um, even use a mortgage calculator to determine whether or not we can afford this place. So it's, it's really helping us. So, so what Zillow is doing is giving us information, and we can choose to look at it or not look at it and then make a decision uh, for ourselves. And Zillow helps us, again, by disclosing this information to us little by little. This is actually a, a positive use of the availability bias in that Zillow is making recent information, like comparable homes, what they estimate the home price to be, available to us, and then allowing us to, to make that decision. They're not telling us you should buy this house or not buy this house. They're allowing us to make that choice by giving us that information that will, make, that will allow us to make the ideal choice. So let's take a look at uh, more emotion. So um, loss aversion plays very heavily upon us. Nobody likes to lose. And we place greater psychological weight on a loss than a gain, especially when it comes to money. So think about the stock market. Um, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll panic when the stock market tanks and sell off everything. And then we'll get back into the market after the price goes, goes up. So we're not buying low and selling high. We're doing the, the opposite. I think it's, this idea is summed up pretty well by Bill, Carcel, Bill Parcells, who's a former um, coach in the National Football League, won a couple of Super Bowls with the New York Giants. He says, losing feels worse than winning feels good. So if we're, fan, we're fans here in Seattle of a team like the, the Seahawks, we feel pretty good that they won the Super Bowl two years ago against the Broncos but we probably feel twice as worse that they lost the Super Bowl one year ago um, against the Patriots at the last second, especially since, you know, <laughs> Did I lose my, Here. am I back again? There you go. Very good, thank you. So sometimes it helps how you frame things when it comes to loss aversion. Do you, do you, do you frame things in a positive light or a negative light, and framing things positively can help us. So for example, if we go to the market, you know, and we want to buy ground beef, 80% lean, oh, it's 80% lean, I think I'll buy that, that's probably healthy. But if we say, now with 20% fat, maybe not so much. <laughs> so a lot of companies can leverage our aversion to loss and help us when we make decisions, especially when it comes to our health, like losing weight. And in this case, um, money's a big motivator for us. So one company failed um, in this regard. What they did for its employees was they started this workplace initiative where they encouraged them to lose weight. And the payoff was you could get a discount on your future health insurance premium depending on how much weight you lost. And for the employees who signed up for this, um, typically, they lost mostly one to two pounds, so not a lot. And the problem was because the payoff was so esoteric. It wasn't, you know, you weren't getting a check, you weren't getting money, you weren't getting dollars. You were gonna get a discount in the future on a health insurance premium. So it's not very sexy and it's not very motivating. So there's another company that's been more successful that, with this, and this is a company called Healthy Wage. And what you do is you contribute a certain amount of month, a month to bet that you're going to lose weight. So what this particular customer did was, was put in over $60 a month for a little bit over a year. 
on the bet that he would lose 100 pounds to get more healthy. So the way this works with healthy wage is that if you, if you do achieve that weight loss, you double your bet. But if you do not achieve the weight loss, then you lose all that money, and, you, and they have you donate it to an organization or a charity. And as an extra motivator, they, they prefer that you donate to an organization that you disagree with. So for example, if you're pro-gun control, all your money, if you lose, goes to the NRA. Um, so this has been pretty successful for these reasons. We're mo more motivated by losses than gains. And I'm not talking here about losing weight. I'm talking about here about losing something that we already have. That's that money that we put into the weight loss bet. That's a real motivator. So loss aversion can really work if we frame what people may lose, money, what we already have, by choosing a non-desired option, not losing weight. So one last example around uh, emotional impact, and this, and this relates to self-facilitation. A lot of times we make irrational purchases. So we may buy a Happy Meal when we're not hungry. We may buy a mocha, mocha frappuccino when we're not thirsty. And we try to control ourselves, but we really can't. So we seek out help from um, companies that can help us. So for example, maybe a financial institution or a bank that can help us with our irrational uh, purchases and control things for us. So what one bank in the um, UK does, HSBC, is they release this mobile app. And this mobile app will text you based on um, your behavior. Um, so what they'll do is they'll utilize two things. One is um, self-control facil facilitation. So they'll tell, tell you based on your spending history that today, for example, today is Friday. It's a day you spend more than any other day of the week. You might want to control your spending this way. Another thing they'll do is they'll use what's called a social proof thing. So um, in this case, what they'll do is they'll compare you to people who have uh, similar incomes and have similar, similar behaviors. So they'll tell you you're spending twice as much as other people um, in your um, income bracket and with your behavior going out to restaurants. And so you could save over 200 pounds a month, for example, by, by eating in and cooking your own meals. So this company, HSBC, is helping us when we make our purchases. purchases. And, I, and I want to emphasize that when we make, make a purchase, we're making a decision. <clears throat> OK, so we're going we're gonna to move to that, that, that third major uh, behavior uh, that we, we need to address. We've dealt with load. We've dealt with anxiety. So again, behavioral economists talk about you know, part of the problem that we see, particularly in long-term decision making and planning, is that we really have evolved uh, for kind of a near-term focus. So where we should be planning for retirement, that yeah. sports car sure looks good in the driveway today. And I, and I think we see this. I think we have to acknowledge the fact, particularly when we go back to looking at that retirement savings, that some, some people, sadly, are just not in a position to be saving the way they should. But there are other people who are just making bad decisions. And again, these are the same people who are taking the fancy vacations, buying the houses they can't afford, eating out four nights a week, so on and so forth. They're living in the here and now. And I, and I think we need to, you know, again, understand and appreciate the fact that we're biased towards this near-term focus. Go ahead, Bob. And the other thing that you see, you know, again, when we look at humans and the decisions they make is often their behaviors are conflicting. And this has driven us crazy as user experience designers forever is that we'll go out and we'll do our user research and they'll tell us one thing, that okay, I want a remote control that has 80 buttons. <laughs> and, and then we design a remote control that has 80 buttons and then what do they do for the next four years? They're using that remote, they use four, and they curse the other 76, okay? <laughs> and we're going like, how can this exist? How can they say one thing and then behave differently when they're actually interacting with and using the product? There's actually a lot of research around this that sh demonstrates that the purchase and adoption decision, the factors that drive that decision, are very different from and actually uh, um, opposed to the, the factors that are going to determine the long-term satisfaction with the use of the system. So we need to appreciate the fact that that tension is there. We go out and we do this research, and we just can't accept it. 
Now, we don't you know, just throw it right in their face and say, oh, you're not going to use 80 buttons. That's not the way you respond. I think we all know that in our research. So let me work you kind of through a scenario. So this is something that is shaped. Once I came across this, so I started adopting this probably 15, 20 years ago in my user research, is when I would see people asking for things that I knew they were likely not going to use or that were going to be problematic and compromise their satisfaction with the product, I tried to give them alternate scenarios. And again, this is a load issue. They're not capable of generating these scenarios in their mind. So what they do is, again, the industry has really equated functionality and bells and whistles with value. The more buttons, the greater the value for your dollar. And we've done that as an industry. We've created that expectation. So what we have to do is we have to give them an alternate scenario because they're not going to run these scenarios through their mind because of the load limitation. So what I would often do with an example like this, I'd run through a, a case like this. I say, first thing I do is I endorse what they tell me. I don't tell them they're wrong. You never do that to a user. So I say, you know, I can understand why you like buttons. I love buttons too. You know? So you, you kind of endorse them, uh, <laughs> what they're saying. You lower their defenses. And then you go on and say, like, you know, humor me for a moment. You know, just kind of play with me for a moment. And, and what if we designed a device with fewer buttons, OK? Uh, but with a lower price point, a lower cost, and an increased use of use. And then I usually would engage in some kind of interact, uh, interactive um, prototyping with them, and I would show them. And so what I've done there is, again, this is, should be going on in their own mind. They should be doing these calculations. They should be doing these comparisons, but they simply don't do it. So what I've done is I've, I've swapped out the false, false value of buttons with real human value of money and time. And, and we have to sometimes provide that for them, OK? And again, once they see that, they'll go like, oh, yeah, that seems reasonable. But they're not going to come up with it on their own. So in summary, what we have to do as UX professionals is really designed to support real people. We have to realize that, as Kahneman states, we're optimized for system one. And we're not really optimized for system two. So we can't design for a classical economic theory where, where people are these mythological, rational, logical agents who think through every decision and, and weigh the pros and cons of everything that they do. We have to build in these design supports and the scaffolding to help support people and optimize for that system too, for that rational thought. Secondly, what we need to do as researchers is understand that people are emotional and irrational, and consider those behaviors and our interactions with users in the field. So not so much listen to what people have to say, but observe what they have to do. And therefore, under, you know, watch them as they're making these decisions um, when they're using our, our products. And finally, we want to um, seek to, to counter all of these distant psychological forces, a lot of these biases that Bill has mentioned. Uh, the availability bias, the confirmation bias, the optimization bi bias, tunnel vision, everything that we have out there. And design solutions, design solutions um, that allow people to make choices for themselves, to make better decisions for themselves without venturing too far down this slippery sl slope of nudging. Now, what this often comes down to is a lot of us in the UX field understand people's behaviors. So I'll leave you with this. We can design for those dark patterns and manipulate people, or we can be more transparent and be able to help our, our customers and our consumers make better decisions for themselves with these design supports and scaffolding. So thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. And I know they want to um, wrap it. Do you want to wrap it up, Alex? Yeah. So Alex says we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, Bill and I will be around. If anybody has any questions afterwards, we'll be, we'll, we, we have uh, business cards, and we'll be ha uh, happy to talk to you about any questions or follow-up you might have. Thank you. Thank you, folks.